Failure Development Review Board for November 1st, 2021 to order. Um, I am Kevin O'Connell, the Vice Chair, and I'm going to ask the members to introduce themselves when I call their name. Uh, Rob? Rob Goodwin, DRB. Michael? Good evening, Michael Lazorchek. Joe? Hi, Joe Kiernan. Uh, Catherine? Catherine Burgess. And Jean is not here, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And Claire? Good evening. And I am Kevin O'Connell, the vice chair of the uh, of the board. And the first order of did Abby get introduced? Uh, I don't believe she did. Yes, Abby. 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 Hi, Abby White. Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna uh, first order of business. It will be uh, a election of the chair of this board. Uh, previous chair Kate McCarthy uh, did a great job, and. Uh, for several years and she stepped down uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so we are at a point where we need to uh, elect a chair for uh, the duration of the, uh, of the term, which will be until August, uh, 2022. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, with pleasure, uh, nominate Rob Goodwin to be the chair and um, I, See if we have a second. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. So uh, we, this vote right now will be for the chair, for the board through August 2022. And so I'll just call the, uh, the members uh, in order and just indicate yay or nay, or yes or no, whichever your preference is. Um, Michael? Yes. Joe? You're muted, Joe. Yes. Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Uh, Claire? I, 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 I guess I had a quick question. I guess I was just wondering if I could ask a question. You can, of course. Please. Um, does Rob want to be the chair? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question and one, one that I can that I can uh, that I can probably uh, suggest that uh, he has agreed to, to take okay. on that uh, that task and that task can be can be quite a bit of work at times. So great. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to nominate Rob. Great. <laughs> okay, so Claire, you still need a vote. Then, then I will say yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, I will also say yes. And uh, I'm not sure protocol has you voting uh, in this. I think Rob has to abstain. I abstain. Uh, I abstain. Rob is going to abstain. Okay. But you can say a few words. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to uh, thank Kevin for his choice of words. Agreed versus uh, Claire's word as want. I think those are, those are <laughs> yeah. very important yeah. distinctions. I, I don't, but um, I don't think anyone uh, wakes up when they're uh, or in this world and wants to be the chairman of a DRB, but uh, here we you are. Know, so. You never know. <laughs> you never know. So Rob, uh, thank you for uh, uh, taking on this task and I'm gonna turn the uh, meeting over to you uh, for the duration this evening. Okay. Do, mm -hmm. we, do we want to reconfigure here or are we all, all happy uh, with the way it's You're set in up? the center of what we've got here right so now. So we're good. Unless like you want to switch. Good. Like this, being able to see things. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, um okay well so um where are we on the agenda here well we jumped the gun a little bit we went to four instead of three but that's okay exactly exactly <laughs> so at this point i will turn oh. it over to mayor <laughs> sorry okay. sorry uh meredith to uh review the remote meeting uh procedures thank you rob all right, I think that everybody we've got here has been on remotely before, um, but I'm still going to go through this, especially because we've got a big agenda tonight. And so we might have people viewing via Orca that would then want to log on once we really get into things. Um, 
Nope, oh, almost misplaced my cheat sheet. All right, so for those of you viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's Development Review Board meeting um, using the Zoom function here. Um, well, I don't know if anybody can see that. Um, yeah, the, sorry, the just realized that. Do, do people see the share screen? Do they see it? Just the meeting? It's the, um, sorry, the slide itself? Or is your Zoom yes. window in the way? No, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so there's your Zoom link here you can use, or you can call in this phone number and use the meeting ID, and that will log you into the meeting as well so that you can participate, you can talk, ask questions. Um, if anybody is having problems accessing the meeting, you can email me. I'll have my email up throughout the whole meeting, um, and I'll try and walk you through it. And if for some reason somebody can't get into the meeting, we'll have to um, continue it to a time and place certain. Um, I'm going to go to the next. I'll leave it here for a little while in case anybody needs it. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning on your video is optional. For everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This is going to reduce background noise. Um, if you're on the, I don't have anybody on through your phone. I'll give that if anybody logs on that way. Um, please save the chat function in Zoom for troubleshooting or logistics questions only. Um, if you have a question or comment about an item on the agenda, we're going to ask that you raise your hand if you're on video or you can use star nine if somebody calls in um, and then you can also if, if we're missing everything because we have a pretty full full zoom window tonight um, feel free to unmute yourself and you know just ask the chair to be recognized um we don't have hold on i'm going to stop my share so i can see the full screen again Yep, we just have applicants right now um, and people helping with the applications. Um, if we end up having some other members of the public sign on partway through, then I'll have to give some some guidance on how they're going to give comments. Um, I want to give a heads up that we do have um, for different applications. We do have some additional materials um, that will circulate as needed um, via email to board members so that they can see them. And there may be also some things that we have to share over Zoom for everybody to see, um, or even some items that I might read into the record tonight, depending on the application. Um, all right, I'm going to hand the meeting back over to our new chair. Okay, thank you, Meredith. Um, I guess our next order of business here is I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda for tonight's meeting before we get too far. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I think that was Abby the first. All right. Second by Abby. Um, we will now do the roll call vote here. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Um, Michael? Yes. Joseph? Yes. <laughs> Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And Jean? Oh, oh, Claire? Yes. No. Uh, we have an agenda approved. Okay. Um, so now we have, I would entertain a motion to approve the uh, minutes from October 4th. And those eligible to vote, to vote are Kevin, myself, Abby, Michael, and Claire. Now you read the roll for it so we can. Oh, I didn't hear. Um, a oh, motion. Motion. Yeah, still motion. waiting on that. Uh, I'll make the motion to approve to approve the minutes of uh, uh, that meeting. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second by Claire. Okay. Uh, Kevin, how do you vote? Yes. Abby? Yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. Claire? Yes. All right. And you get a vote. 
And I also vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> Minutes are approved. Okay, bear with us. We're, uh, this is my first rodeo, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank no, you, everybody. No, no worries, Rob. Just, yep, you know, you're doing, just fine. you're doing. Yeah. Okay, so um, our next order of business um, is our first application on the agenda. So I think for efficiency, we should, uh, anyone that wishes to speak tonight on all the applications, we can square them in. Or just uh, no, we gotta do one at a time. One one they're yeah, they're right. technically different hearings. Right, okay, all right. So anyone here that is going to speak on the um, Gin Lane application, um, and yep, would you up. please stand up or what? Raise your right raise hand. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. So we've got Brian and Nathan. Okay. Uh, and your your name is? Would you just introduce yourself real quick? Uh, I'm Nathan Coleman. Okay. And then online we have Brian Lane Parnas. From the Wolf Park. Park. Okay, two folks. Um, okay. Uh, Is it set? Do you have it? Yes. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. All right. Thank you very much. You can come up to the center, Mindy. And adjust the microphone as you need to to the height to make sure you can speak into it. Perfect. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear Minty? Hi. Okay. okay. Lots of nods. Perfect. Okay. So uh, we have uh, an application here on Gin Lane, and I guess the order of a biz uh, event here is. We'll have Meredith give a brief overview of the application, and we'll applicant will have some time to sort of present their project uh, to the board and the public, um, and then we'll go into questions from the board and any questions that the public uh, may have and, uh, and move forward. So, Meredith. Okay, so I'm going to keep this pretty brief because we got to move things along tonight with three applications. Um, this is a major site plan application. So it triggers all the different reviews in our chapter um, 320, um, or at least I had to do a preliminary one, which is why the staff report's so long, um, because it is for the creation of more than 10 parking spaces. Um, and there are several requests in here, um, including approval for more than two times the minimum number of parking spaces in relation to Caledonia Spirits itself. Um, this would be off-site, additional off-site parking for Caledonia Spirits. So you have to factor that into the, the base Caledonia Spirits use. Um, and then there's also um, two requests for variances from specific landscaping provisions. One is from the street trees requirement and one is from the shade trees requirement. Both of those things that the street trees is triggered because it's major site plan along a street frontage. Um, and then the shade trees requirement is triggered because of the um, creation of the parking spaces um, in a new parking lot. Um, so those are those are the the major items um, and the the major items that are in here in red. Um, there's a few other notes about in the sorry in the staff report. There's a few other things um, that are noted. A lot of those things really have to do more with um, things that the, the applicant should just be aware of for future permitting. Um, there is also, sorry, hold on one second. It's going off, it's not supposed to go off. Um, there's also a question about how the board wants to handle um, outdoor lighting and the pedestrian access. And those are things that really I raised more um, because those are provisions that we get that look, are looked at, but based on this particular site and the way things are done, it's not like they have to do lighting or have to do the pedestrian access under the regulations, but there's some options there. So those are, that's how I see it. And I'm gonna <laughs> pass it over to Minty if that's good for you, Rob. Absolutely, that's great. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you for having us here. This is my second second visit to the board, but um, we're, um, 
as all of you know, we have a major manufacturing facility that we've built in downtown Montpelier on Gin Lane. And we also have um, a bar and retail business at Gin Lane. And so we have different needs for the business um, based on the time of day. So uh, last spring, um, my um, Ryan and I, we were able to buy the little piece of land right in front of the, the factory, which is 0.28 acres. And that's the subject of tonight's discussion is that little piece of land. It used to be a, um, an oil spray garage for cars um, there. And as part of our development of Gin Lane, the garage that used to house that, um, that business uh, was torn down. And the other thing that happened that was very surprising during the pandemic is that the railroad decided to put in a new railroad line and keep both of the lines surrounding that land active. So we have a situation where we have almost no usable space and a house is sitting there as well. We still have the house. So that's sort of the little history of the, of the land. So when the railroad came in, they had to clean up the lot as they finished up the railroad and they took down all the trees that were in their right of way. So when we talk about trees, um, they had re strict requirements for us as we built Gin Lane in not to have any trees in the line of sight of the railroad. And since the, both those two lines that come to an apex on the corner of our land, there's almost no place on the lot that isn't in line of sight of the railroad, unfortunately. Um, we're definitely big tree people, but in this case, um, I think the railroad dictates what we can or cannot do in their rights of way. And most of the lot actually is very constrained by their rights away. So I just wanted to give that background. So when we get to the tree discussion, you'll have some, some reason why there are no trees there. Um, but while we're doing this project, it's a pretty exciting project for us actually, um, because it has a silver lining. The lot is actually a brownfield site. So you have a brownfield site um, that needs to be remediated and working with um, Brian from DeWolf Engineering and Stone Environmental, um, we came up with what we thought was a very clever plan to um, have parking, but to have it to be green parking. So through the use of using uh, geo blocks and geo pavers, what you're gonna see when it's all done, the lot will be remediated and capped for environmental purposes and then we'll put these geo blocks and geo pavers down and the grass will be able to grow through so what is now kind of an old gravelly eyesore will become like a grassy yard with a driveway going down the middle to the house so we feel that it's a um, quite a major upgrade um, and per the railroad, we do have to put a picket fence around it to keep people off the tracks, because as I say, it comes together and there is a danger there. So, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a great solution to um, providing uh, the parking we need for the, um, our business as it grows um, for our employees. And when there's overflow parking, when we have a lot of people. Our schedule at the factory runs from 5 a.m. to sometimes 11 at night with our bar staff. So we have quite a span of time where we need parking. And at any given time, we can get an extra people and need a little extra parking as well. So the employees will move down to this lower lot and make room for our customers. So that's the plan. We think it's a good plan. And um, Quick question. Uh, sure. What's the What's the fate of the, uh, of the house that uh, is there currently? Oh, that's our next permit application. Okay. <laughs> it's not part of this. It's uh, no, part of this. Uh, we've had our hands full with the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, I can't so, imagine. So uh, that's, uh, we're not sure. We're not sure. You know, we, 
it was rental property when we bought it. It's not no longer rental property. Yeah. We we haven't decided. Yep. That's that's the best answer right now. Yeah. And um Oh, I was just going to say, uh, Minty, if you're done, I'm happy to just give a kind of overview of the design, if that's useful for the board, um, or also happy to address, you know, some of the things that um, Meredith had raised in the staff report as well. Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Um, can I share my screen on the Zoom? Oh, I can. Yes, please. Great. Um, so just in case anyone is not familiar with the site, this is just your standard um, Google overhead photo. Um, so uh, here's Barry Street running along here, turning into Pioneer Street, uh, Granite Street, and Stonecutter's Way comes in over here. Um, unfortunately, it's not the most recent photo, but this, um, this property right here is where the distillery was constructed. Um, so here's Gin Lane. Um, and then this is the, the property in question here. Um, so this overhead photo shows the, the sort of long-standing railroad track that runs along the south of the property. And then the recently constructed railroad track essentially runs along this little tree line. And oh, let me get a little closer here. Um, runs along this tree line here and then crosses Gin Lane and across Berry Street sort of uh, caddy corner along there. So that's the, the property is, is pretty unique in that it's bordered by railroad on the south, railroad on the north, and then, um, you know, public street on the east side. So it's, it is, as, as Minty mentioned, it's, it's quite constrained. Um, this is the proposed site plan. Um, so in the same orientation, but just so everybody knows, here's the railroad track to the south. Here's the railroad track that's to the north and the west. Gin Lane to the east, Berry Street, you know, a little further to the north. This is the recently constructed bike path and the crossing right here at Berry Street. Um, so here's the existing um, house on the lot, and uh, the parking will all be to the east of that. Um, right now, um, the driveway used to come out on Berry Street, but when the railroad came through and put the, the tracks here, they relocated it um, onto Gin Lane. Uh, here it is, just south of the signal box. Um, so we're essentially proposing to just move that basically one driveway width further to the south along Gin Lane. Um, just to provide some additional separation between the railroad crossings and this drive. Um, and then the parking lot, this sort of um, square cross hatch area um, will be the geo pave. So both, all of this is uh, permeable pavement. So it's like um, a system where there's a, a plastic um, matrix that's it's stiff, it's put down over a prepared uh, sub base of, of crust stone. Um, then it's either infilled with um, topsoil and planted for grass, or it's infilled with like a, a, a pea stone, like a small, um, maybe like eighth to half inch kind of uh, washed stone. Um, so that the center section with the cross hatching, the square cross hatching will be the, the stone. Um, so this will essentially will look like a stone driveway. And then where we have the, the indication of the actual parking spaces, um, this will be grass surfaced. Um, so, you know, the, the visual effect of this, as Mindy said, will just be, you'll, what you'll see is the driveway and you won't really see the parking spaces because it'll just all be um, grassed area. Um, we are proposing split rail fence here along the railroad right of ways. Um, and I'll just flip over here. Um, in terms of landscaping, um, you know, in order to maintain the sight lines and, and safety with cars along Gin Lane and, and, and pedestrians along Gin Lane and um, the two railroad crossings on Gin Lane, um, we've got chokeberry shrubs here along Gin Lane and then um, ornamental grass plantings along the north between the parking area and Berry Street. Um, just to be clear about the use of the parking lot here. It is, it is intended to only be used as um, overflow parking for employees. So, so at times when there's not enough parking, um, which is already happening at the distillery, um, then employees would come in and park in this parking area and then access the distillery by, by walking down Gin Lane. So um, I'll just stop for a second here. If anyone on the board has questions about the sort of general design of the project or where things are, things like that. Um, happy to answer them. 
Kevin? Uh, oh. uh, so, Brian, um, the parking will not be used by customers who are who are then walking to the uh, to the building and accessing what services you have there that are there. Yeah, that's not the intention. I mean, if there is like um, a really a really large event or something, it's possible that that customers may park there. But you know, on a day to day basis, that's not the intention. My 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 main concern is the safety of the site, and I mean the trains uh, when they when they traverse the that area, they go pretty slow and they're pretty careful and they ring their bell and all that. Uh, but um, you know, I I I just a little concerned about how um, the safety of people using that uh, extended parking lot, uh, uh, how that'll be uh, handled. I mean, is there additional lighting, signalization, I'm just things of that nature? Yeah, so both of the railroad tracks have, um, and correct me if I'm wrong about the one by the road, Minty, but I believe both of the railroad tracks have not only lights, but uh, gates on them. So when the trains come by, you get the bells, you get the flashing lights and the gates drop down to block um, access. So it's, it's um, certainly really well marked in terms of the railroad crossing. And, um, you know, I would, I would say a lot better than some of the railroad crossings that are in um, downtown when there's a lot more pedestrians uh, that may be uh, crossing. So, so, I, I, I'm not the, sure the ones across Berry Street have gates. Yeah, that's what They I mean. have lights for sure. The one crossing where you're referring to going into our lot, we have the most this one. highly regulated one with gates and everything. So, right. yeah, I didn't think um, it was so gates. it's very safe going into our our parking lot in Gin Lane. So that would be the one that you would be addressing. Right now, there are no fences, so we're actually taking a lot that was directly on the railroad tracks and making it safer through this project. Um, Per, you know, I spent a lot of time working with the railroad guys to, you know, to get some kind of idea of what they would allow us to do or not, because we really are constrained by their requirements and their rights of way. They have a lot of uh, uh, privileges that is part yes, of their Yes, they those, do. Their yes. Law. And they have a lot of uh, sway when it comes to trees. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't really want those trees there. Sorry. <laughs> Claire, did you have a question? Uh, yes, um, I had a couple of questions around the like the, the demarcation of the parking area and the parking spots. Um, so it sounds like the the travel way will be gravel, but the the parking stalls will have the 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 pavers in which the grass can go through. So 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 the travel way will be visually a a a roadway surface and then the it's just the parking stalls that will have that kind of grass paper is that correct yeah that's right uh, even though the whole thing is permeable um it'll 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 look like a gravel drive in the middle gotcha and then is there any um uh wheel stops or any kind of markation to indicate kind of where people would park in the parking stall area so there aren't, you can't really put wheel stops into this uh, system. Um, on the north end where the majority of the parking spaces are, there's the 15 on the north side, it'll be constrained by the, by the landscaping. Um, so the, the chokeberry bushes here on the east side, the grasses as well as the fence on the north side. And then here on the uh, west side, there's an existing sewer pump station with bollards. Um, so this area is pretty well defined. Um, you know, you have a kind of similar definition on the south with um, these bushes here. Um, we hadn't planned any particular demarcation here, but, you know, the, the driveway itself kind of lends you to understand where you should be parking your car because you pull off the driveway and then stop, essentially, um, as well as because this is going to be um, the overflow parking, um, you know, Caledonia will have some um, control over how people park and also some ability to instruct folks as, as to how to do it. So um, we feel that the proposed level of demarcation is appropriate to the, the uh, overflow nature of the parking lot. You know, if we put a lot of demarcation here, then we have a lot, we have more chance that someone is going to end up parking here who we don't necessarily want to be parking, um, whether it's bike path access or 
um, you know, folks that could be accessing the distillery from a closer parking space or, or something like that. Great, thank you. Okay, Rob, it's Michael. If I could have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. And maybe I'm just not understanding the, the response here, but how are you proposing to limit access to the lot when you determine overflow parking is not necessary? It's, uh, there's no physical barrier to park the lot, um, but we're trying not to make it look really obvious that you should park here. Um, so if you're a visitor to the distillery, um, you're going to come down Gin Lane and you're going to see the very large paved parking area and all the signage and the distillery itself um, in front of you. Really no, there's nothing to sort of pull people into this parking lot. Um, you know, if they're, what their intention is, is to visit the distillery. Um, you know, we're not planning to like gate it or anything like that. Um, but the fact that it's just going to be a, a gravel driveway and then it'll, the rest of it will appear to be grass will, um, I think, people's desire to park here. But okay. so just a, I guess, two quick follow up questions. And what's the significance of calling it overflow parking? Why not just call it additional parking? I guess I'm, I'm lost on that. And then to Kevin's earlier point, if we are concerned about safety and access and you just have an open parking lot what's preventing people from you know parking there and and going hiking around or, or just doing unintended uses there i guess i'm a little confused why not just gate it well i i do believe that we get um people who are accessing the bike path and i do believe that we get people who want to go down to the town's riverfront um, right of way that we have that was granted to them during this project. So we already have people who are just interested in walking around or walking on the bike path, parking up on Gin Lane. And we've never had a problem with that. Um, it's, it's an open place. It's a hospitality place. We want, we want people to feel welcome. So that has not been a problem. The town does plan to uh, finish the connection from the bike path, to Gin Lane. Um, and that was supposed to happen this summer. I haven't checked on it lately, but that was su supposed to happen. So just by default, I'm sure that some people who park in our parking lot now are associated with um, either the bike path or um, whether they're biking or or not. They may not be biking, they may just be walking. And we're, we're fine with that. Um, some of those people are our customers, so it, it's not a problem. We can also, we do a lot of work with cones to keep people like off the grass where they ride on the grass and stuff like that. We can also cone off this area easily with, you know, just in the driveway, you can just put a few cones and people won't go in there. But it, it's, it's not, I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be um, used improperly by anybody. I think it'll just be an open area and we'll use it when we need it. It's, um, it's not gonna be every day, but it'll be sometimes and we'll, we'll see, you know, um, but I, we haven't I, had I don't... any trouble with people just showing up like that. Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I work for a different town in Vermont and open access parking lots keep me up at night, but, you know, I applaud you guys for, for being willing to be flexible and open. And I guess if you're willing to, to take it on, who am I to say otherwise? But just curious. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. We hadn't we hadn't uh, worried about that. Let's put it that way, because we're as I say, we we're a factory, but we're also a hospitality business, and um, we welcome people to our site. Um, so, Catherine, two questions, and then I've got a process question for you, Meredith. If Perfect. Well. So um, first, I'd be interested to hear about the documented need for additional parking, mm -hmm. you know, both in terms of uh, current state of affairs and future. Mm -hmm. And I also um, like to hear, unless I missed it somewhere in the materials, 
whether you have um, bike facilities, bike parking right now, both for staff and for um, for visitors. Yes. Especially given the conversation right now around the bike trail. I'll take the, the second one first. We we absolutely do have bike racks up on the in the main parking lot near the facility. Um, and the other question was, the, what's the documented need for additional parking now versus and what do you project uh, um, changes to be in the future? From day one, as I say, our schedule, we start with our manufacturing crew comes in early. And then we used to be open at noon. We, um, as most hospitality businesses have had a hard time opening, so has Caledonia Spirits, but we're well on our way now. But what we found when we were going great guns was that our our census in the parking lot, so to speak, was variable. So if we were expecting a group, say hospitality group, we haven't had any of those recently. Make sure you're oh, I'm sorry. That's no, okay. I, I, I can't. Um, I can't. Okay. Um, that we would ask the employees to park around back or along the side or down on Gin Lane. So. We've already had to relocate our employees at times to accommodate an inflow of guests. So, and it can happen at any time during the day or in the evening. Uh, we like to think we can predict when it'll happen because people will call up and reserve, you know, so we know what sort of demand. Right now we're constrained by COVID because we do everything by reservations, but when you're not a reservation based business, you can get more people at certain times than you're expecting. So all of that has led us to, um, we know we need more parking and we could just park down in this area as it is. We could just park there because it is flat, it's gravel, um, but it is a contaminated site and we need to fix it. And so we decided to formalize the actual parking down there so that it's clear for employees where to park and it looks better. It's gonna look a lot better. And um, yeah, we're pretty excited about it because I think it'll, it'll make it easier for everybody. Yeah, and Brian's gonna talk a little bit about lighting because we do believe we need better lighting on that lot. Process question yes. is Meredith and I received an email with comments on this. Yep. I just want to, okay, you've got it. Yeah. So yeah, well when we get to the um, public comment stage here, once the board has finished asking its questions, I'll be able to take the email that we got and put it into the record. Um, okay. and I can circulate it to the board members who are remote. Sure. I, yep. Uh, Abby first. Abby. Hi, I'm curious about the number of spaces that you've um, applied for. I believe it's 22. Did you, what is, what's the kind of magic number about 22? And did you look to um, have fewer at all? Did you explore your options? Uh, that's what Brian came up with that could fit is, I believe is the number, right? Yeah, <laughs> honestly, that 22 spaces is what would fit uh, reasonably on the lot. Uh, without disturbing the house or the pump station or getting in, in the way of the railroad tracks. So um, if anything, they could really use more than that. Um, but this is what we could reasonably fit on the lot. Okay, so how are you estimating the number of spots that you need? What's, what's, the, what's kind of your estimated range, if you will? For formalized spots, I think that puts us up to what um, I had that number two weeks ago, right in my brain, and I set it aside here. I think it brought us up to set, was it seventy eight? How many do we have now, Brian? Yeah, I'm I'm getting there. This so will 50. bring you up to seventy nine, according 79. to my calculation. Yeah. Um, there, there is um also a house there as we mentioned so the the house actually needs a couple of sp um, spaces as well we do have um you know when when we're busy we're using every single spot up on the main parking lot and sometimes down gin lane and when we host things like um 
two winters ago, we hosted the uh, Montpelier Farmers Market. People were parked everywhere, all over. This lot actually gives us a way to formalize that parking when people ask us, hey, can you host this, um, this event? And this gives us a place for our employees to park. It gives us, you know, better parking, safer parking for everybody involved. Um, go ahead. Right uh, so just because I am, um, Brian and Minty and I had some conversations in between these two, two hearing dates, yeah. cause I'm allowed to talk to them. Yeah. Um, I think when we had a conversation at one point, you told me how many employees you have um, for the factory and then maybe also some of your, your other staff. And I think that was part of the consideration as well, if you add those two together and then bring yeah, in. Currently we have 58 employees. They're not all in Vermont. Um, I don't know what the exact breakdown is on the top of my head for the Vermont employees that are in and out, but Okay. Um, and then, as I said, they have different schedules. So we have some in the morning, some in the afternoon, in the, into the evening. So yeah. I would have to get you the exact count, but it's um, it's variable. That's the point. The point yeah. is that our parking demand is variable. So most of the time, our parking in Caledonia Spirits is just fine. But when we have an event, when we have say a hospitality group comes in, 15 to 25 people, parking demand goes up. So it's really all about, and, and that's why we call it overflow parking, because it's, here's your current demand, and this is what happens when X happens in the, in the distillery. So it's extra parking that we need on occasion. And you know, and if you're doing really well, you know, maybe, more than every, not every day, but certainly once a week that we would have extra people that we might have to request the employees park down below. But particularly if you're having a daytime event so you have both types of staff in plus yes. your- during your the day. Hospitality yes. customers. Yes, and before the pandemic, not right now, but we know it'll come back, at least we're hoping it'll come back. We had a lot of events. We had people having lunches and you know birthday parties and stuff like that. During the day, we had things at night where we needed this kind of flow of extra parking because it met the needs of our business. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Rob. Yeah, I just have one uh, more on the parking issue question for Meredith. Mm -hmm. So if this is staff parking versus public parking, is there anything different as far as the site development requirements? Um, if it's either or? No, the, the regulations okay. themselves do not distinguish between the two. Yes. Um, and that's one reason this comes to the board exactly. um, as to yes. your your judgment as to how it should be dealt with, whether or not, you know, and originally it sounded like it was just employees, which is what was, seemed to be in the application, but it sounds like there might be some other minor use of it as well. So yeah. it, it's a question for the board well, as to how they want to deal with it. Well, definitely for there may be some use by the public. I, I, right, that's I, what I mean. We haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that, but that's what happened with our, our regular parking lot. People come in, they park, you know, they want to walk around and they're not customers, but they do show up because we're a public place and it hasn't been a problem. I don't anticipate it being a problem. This just gives us more room to accommodate things like that. Yeah. Okay. Kevin. Yeah, just to the further question on the on the number of parking spaces. Um, your business is relatively new uh, for that location, mm -hmm. and I'm going to guess that uh, pandemic aside, the business will grow. Uh, as more and more people become familiar with it. We hope with so. It. Yeah, I mean, that's your plan, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so what have you done to anticipate that demand, you know, five, 10 years out? Uh, you mean in terms of parking? Yeah. Uh, I think we think about where, where we could access parking. We can't park on Berry Street, but there may be other places nearby that we could access for parking. We have thought about that. And, and I would say that, that this, this proposal is Caledonia Spirits thinking about their parking and their business growing. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when, when the when the distillery was originally approved, um, you know, there was there was a number of parking spaces, and the number of parking spaces was approved was really the maximum that would have fit on that lot. Like you you look at that lot, I think it's large, but it it we used up every single foot of developable space on that lot. So that's you know, I think that Caledonia would have um, proposed more parking for the distillery under the original proposal had they had space for it. And, um, you know, now they have the opportunity to, to they had the opportunity to acquire this lot and they did. And, and so they're, this is part of how they're meeting, um, you know, current demand and, and looking to make more room for future growth as well by having um, an alternate place to put employees to free up more parking at the main distillery parking lot. Thank you. Catherine. I realize in our discussion, we haven't spoken at all about the permeable paving or aside from in the, the opening comments. So I'll say personally, I'm very excited to see it in use. Wondering if maybe uh, your engineer, you could speak to the durability and how it handles the winter, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also whether you're gonna incorporate anything. I, I realize there's not signage um, there's not demarcation on the spots, but are you going to have educational signage or any materials on what the what the permeable pavement is? Is this like yes. a learning opportunity for people? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, the whole site is not marked right now, but it will be at some point for all the different um, aspects of it. Uh, we, uh, it, it's an interesting site and, and Brian is is being very honest when he said we used up every inch of it because the whole site is actually a stormwater system um, so that we don't pollute into the um, river. You know, we're way above the, the flood plain, but we have to be really careful about everything. So, and we haven't done what we wanted to do, which is, you know, the whole idea of the honey and the wildflowers and all that. We just haven't gotten to it because we were only open what seven seven eight nine ten months before the pandemic showed up so it's definitely on our list to um have pollinator habitat and um and then we would also highlight the um the green aspects of our i think a, a good term for it is pervious payment pavement so that we're not um withholding you know the storm water is is able to go down through the ground yeah and um, to speak to the durability, the, the this system is designed. So the, the reason we did the, the grass in the parking spaces and then the, the gravel on, on the more traveled center section is the gravel does hold up better to regular traffic, um, but both systems are designed to support traffic loads. And, um, you know, with the amount of uh, sub base that we're proposing below the, the permeable paver structure, um, you know, we're, we're meeting the manufacturer's recommendations for um, pretty heavy access fire trucks and, and things like that, even on the, the grass areas. So, um, you know, this is a product that's been used in the Northeast. Um, certainly the, the gravel part uh, holds up very well to paving. The grass part, if it's, or plowing, I'm sorry. Um, the grass part, if it's plowed a lot in the winter, you probably need to do some maintenance in the spring with reseeding and things like that. Um, but it, it generally is, you know, certainly for the kind of, you know, even the heavy end of the use that's being contemplated once a week, having people park out there, um, it's, it's more than durable and to stand up to that. Um, I just also, I, I've been meaning to point out and I hadn't had a chance yet that um, while there's no distinction between like employee parking or overflow parking in the regulations, um, the park, the parking section of the regulations does encourage the use of permeable pavers for for low use parking areas. So, this kind of parking area was contemplated in the regulations, even if it wasn't specifically, um, you know, there weren't specifically like different requirements or standards for this sort of parking area. Claire, did you have a question about parking? I do. Yes. Um, so I, I, re I really appreciate the approach here to this parking area, both from kind of the environmental um, aspect and both the also the aesthetic aspect of kind of creating this area that is has the visual look of maybe more of a grassy field look. So you're not kind of creating this um, 
paved area that's not being used all the time. And, and you kind of alluded to this um, in, in a statement that was just made. And I was curious about like, is there a tipping point um, where the, the use um, is, uh, you know, kind of this is kind of that overflow parking, maybe it's not being used all the time. Um, is, is there a tipping point where kind of the durability goes down? And if it's being used more and more and more and more that you would have to kind of reconsider the kind of paving approach and consider a different type of surface if the parking lot was being used at a higher level than kind of originally anticipated? Yeah, so the only durability issue if it was used more than we are proposing um, is that it'd be difficult to maintain the grass cover uh, in the grass parking spaces. The actual structure of the, the permeable paving system is the same um, it's just the infill within the actual paving units that's different that is, you know, there to support the grass. So, you know, if if in the future this becomes uh, it becomes an issue to maintain the grass there, it would be possible to, um, you know, remove the grass and fill and replace it with a, a, a sort of stone infill and maintain the permeability of the paving system and, um, you know, then mitigate the issue of, of not um, being able to maintain grass in there. But as I said, with, with the amount of use that we're contemplating here, it, it, it certainly will be able to hold up and uh, have a decent grass uh, growth over the parking, the uh, permeable parking spaces where grass is proposed. Great, and I guess I had a follow-up question there that kind of made me think you'd, man you'd mentioned that it's a, 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 the design with those pavers is a way for you to also manage the the stormwater runoff. And so if if for some reason that was all being overloaded in some way, then there would be kind of a trigger to kind of revisit the, the surface area, the durability um, and, and all of that, right? Yeah, and I mean, this system is, is pretty good at maintaining its permeability um, as well um, because it's got the structure of the, um, the, the plastic uh, paving units. So you can use a very open grade stone that would, you know, normally get, um, you'd be like driving on marbles if you didn't have the, the structure below it. And then below, uh, let's see, I have a, it's probably not super easy to see on these details, but let me see how big I can make it. So below the, this is sort of the plastic part that's infilled with the, uh, the open graded stone. And then below that is, is additional open graded stone. So we're proposing like below the plastic part, there's another six inches of stone. So that um, not only is very high permeability, so like well beyond the permeability of like lawn, uh, it also provides quite a bit of storage for stormwater inside that stone. So when we put this in, it's going to be far more permeable than is if you had just put, um, you know, grass down even uh, in the lot. And it, and it maintains its permeability pretty well uh, over time. Thank you. We just get a weather report here from the board. I think that um, this issue of whether we're okay with these permeable paver system uh, is something we have to determine tonight. So folks want to raise their hand or say yes if you feel like you have enough information and are uh, okay to move forward on that um, issue. Uh, on specifically on the, perme yeah. the permeability issue, yes. The material, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I feel like we've had a pretty thorough discussion on parking here. I think there's maybe two items that um, we have to address in the staff report or related to the parking. Um, one of them is um, the issue of ADA compliance. And yeah, I don't know and if Brian you guys discuss a, a little bit of that. Brian has a hand, I, he sent that to you, right? Yeah, I have it here on the screen as well. Yeah. Um, hopefully you can see it. So um, in order to maintain the ADA compliance per the comment that we got from um, Mr. Lyon at uh, the DPW, um, we can simply uh, restripe a bit of the existing parking at the Caledon Spirits um, main parking lot. Um, so this is illustrating the, the location of the existing ADA parking. And right now there's three spaces um, so these, these two spaces here have, are two nine foot spaces with a nine foot aisle. And then currently there's a five foot aisle and another nine foot space here. Um, if we remove the striping from this aisle and the 
the ADA symbol from this space, sort of put the striping on the other side of that, um, you know, total island space, then we can move the island between two spots here and create a fourth um, accessible space next to the distillery, um, relocate the sign. Um, so that because these are both nine foot wide spaces with a nine foot wide aisle, these both qualify as van accessible spaces. So we'll have two van accessible spaces, two standard ADA spaces. Um, and yeah, we sent this to Meredith um, very recently. So I'm sure folks haven't had a chance to um, look it over, but it's a pretty straightforward change to maintain the ADA compliance for the site overall. So just to summary, you have two ADA uh, van accessible and one regular, and you're just going to add an extra regular? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any board questions on ADA compliance? Um, any other board questions generated to the parking? I think we've got lighting and access and um, landscaping issues, but maybe we can get this parking taken care of. I'm okay on the parking. I do have some additional questions on the landscaping and lighting. Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, sort of just directly related to the parking, but different is the access. So could you run through sort of how folks would get from this parking lot to the Bar Hill, the employees would get back and forth? Sure, so essentially we're proposing that the access would be along Gin Lane. Um, is, it was noted by DPW, and this is in the staff report. Um, I'm just trying to pull this particular section out. Um, Gin Lane is a city street. It's, uh, it's classified as a low volume shared street by the city. And this we got from Mr. Lyon at the, at the DPW. Um, so the, um, for a low volume uh, shared street, um, pedestrians are allowed to use the roadway uh, in, in shared with uh, vehicle access. Um, and uh, DPW determined that this parking lot wouldn't create enough traffic along Jim Lane to change the classification so that, um, that there's no uh, trigger for the city to add additional pedestrian uh, or bike facilities along Jim Lane. Um, we don't really have the facility to, to add pedestrian access along Jim Lane because it is a city street. Um, so we're relying on the determination from the Montpelier DPW that it's appropriate for um, Gin Lane to be used as a shared um, access space for pedestrians, um, vehicles, and, and bicycles. And so the access would be along Gin Lane and then through the existing parking lot along Caledonia Spirits uh, development to, for folks to access the distillery. Do you feel like the split rail fence uh, is going to be a deterrent from folks crossing the tracks directly from the parking lot shortest distance? Yes, absolutely. So they don't go that way. The, uh, on the other side of the railroad track are elderberry bushes, yeah. and it's steep. Okay. So they're very unlikely to go there. I've never seen anyone cross the track and come up through the bushes. Sure. They always yeah, go, they actually go to the end where the and then they go on to Gin Lane and up that way, up the driveway. Yeah. I, I've personally done a fair amount of bushwhacking around that for the development, and it's not an attractive <laughs> crossing. No. Yeah, that's a, that's good information to. It's not uh, inviting. The... Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> on the map, it just looks like, you know. No, it isn't. It isn't. And I spend a good deal of time right. with the railroad guy walking, and he said, I don't want people crossing here. You've got to put up a fence. Yeah. What is their, is it their right, is it a right of way or do they actually own the land? They, they have a right of way on our land. Oh, on your land. On both you. sides. And, and yes. how wide is that? Is that uh, right that's because that's what uh, railroads have. No, no, I, my question was how wide is the right oh, of way? Oh, 25 feet. 25. Yeah. 25 Either feet. side of the tracks. And it's, it's shown here on the plan. So this, this the dash line is the edge of the right of way on the north and then uh, it's a little hard to see here for some reason, but this line here is the edge of the right of way on the south part of the property. So it's 25 feet for. And you'll notice each. it goes right through the house. Oh. So for, I mean, for zoning 
wise purposes, typically, you know, we we basically count the you know the railroad tracks or the or the railroad's property, and then a lot of time the right of way line, for all intents and purposes, we count as a boundary line, really, because you're right. going to have to set back your buildings from that too, right. a lot of the time. So. It it's, is like a boundary line. It's it's pretty much a boundary line. Unfortunately, <laughs> we lost a lot of land to that yeah. boundary line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other bar questions on access between? No. Um, I think specifically the next issue maybe we should tackle is the um the, the vegetation uh, and landscaping uh, variants. So Meredith, would you give an overview of sort of the, the key um, sort of zoning yep. <laughs> requirements for this? Yep. Um, so the two that are that the variances are being requested from are the ones I'm going to outline because everything else was was compliant. Um, so the first is the street trees. Um, so once you hit a major site plan, you have to look at this subsection for street trees, and. Um, Street trees, this is just, I want to throw this out there that street trees are located within the road right of way or those that are where the center of the tree trunk is located within 10 feet of the frontage line. So street trees are only going to be along the boundary line that borders gin lane. Um, and there are minimum street tree requirements if you have a major site plan that has street frontage involved. I'm not going to go into the details on those right now. Um, so are so, you suggesting that the street trees would be along Gin Lane where the bushes are? Right. They'd have to be, if, if street trees were required, that's where the street trees would have to be placed. Um, so under the, under the regs with over a hundred feet of frontage on Gin Lane, when you just take the, these requirements on their face, um, it would require at least two large street trees and three medium or small tree, street trees along along the street frontage. If this were your standard major site plan, you know, development of a, a vacant parcel along a street um, with major site plan. Um, you know, in this case, any any place here where you would plant a street tree, it would be next to one of the two railroad crossings or in between them um and that's that's why the the applicant is requesting a variance from that well we want to tackle street trees before we then go to the um, yeah. shade trees i, I have yeah. to tell you the very first thing that happened on this site in order to build gin lane um and get it all sorted out with the railroad. The very first thing they did was request that we take down all the trees <laughs> right where we're showing those bushes right. <laughs> because they were concerned about the person in a car not being able to see down the track or vice versa, the train conductor not being able to see someone on Gin Lane. So, the very place where you would like trees, which would be nice to have a row of trees down there, um, was the very place where all those were removed when we first built the facility. So I have a feeling that that wouldn't fly. Do you, what do you think, Brian? Well, certainly the, the railroad has requested. So I was gonna address this because uh, it comes up in the, in the, um, the staff report. Um, so we had the letter from Vermont Rail where they requested that trees not be planted at the crossing. Um, but our communications with them is that their strong preference is that trees not be planted anywhere on this property, um, which really has to do with the fact that once a car gets past one of these two crossings or a pedestrian or a bicyclist and you're in between the two crossings here, um, you know, because this track comes down at an angle and it comes to meet this track, you know, if you're headed in this direction, you know, any tree that's planted here or anywhere along the frontage is blocking some view of what you can currently see of a train uh, approaching the tracks, approaching the crossing from, from this direction. Um, and similarly, if you were headed north on Gin Lane, um, you know, 
uh, even though we couldn't plant a tree here because there's a sewage pump station, but even if you planted a tree here, if you're coming along Jim Lane, you know, there's a point at which that tree is blocking your view uh, of the tracks as you're approaching the, um, the crossing. Um, so that's, that's generally the, the safety consideration and the sort of unique circumstance here is that you have this triangular shaped lot with railroad tracks fronting on two sides. Um, and so there's visibility issues in, in almost any direction over this parking lot. Um, and that's, that's, you know, beyond someone who's stopped at the crossing, um, we wanna make sure that anyone who's approaching the crossing um, has time to be able to see a train um, approaching. And that's, and that's why we're requesting the variance to not, not plant either the street or <coughs> parking lot trees. Safety is the main consideration. So the uh, question I have is, so the, 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 uh, the current plan is for no street trees, no shade trees, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, so everything would be low growth uh, yep. shrubs and so on. So um, if, if we were to uh, insist on some tree planting, where could you put them? Well, our contention is that you can't put them anywhere because wherever you put them, they block some amount of visibility of the railroad tracks. Okay. Any other questions from the board on street trees? Just with, I'll just comment, uh, just with the information we currently have, I would be inclined to agree with the no trees. Uh, uh, safety is really a major consideration. Safety is that, like their number one. Like, yeah. I mean, I think it's a shame because it's, it you is know, a shame. You, look at, you look at that on a, you know, 90 degree day and that place is going to swelter. Well, you know. Yeah, at least it's oh. not pavement. Right, and I would, I would point this out too, it doesn't really go to the variance criteria, but um, you know, both the aesthetic impact and heat island impact of a typical paved parking lot are, are mitigated in this case by the materials we're proposing. Um, you know, the, the stone is gonna be like a light color stone in, in, the, in the infill and the geopave and the, the grass cover on the parking spaces will have a significant mitigation on both the visual and, and heat impacts of this parking lot. Sure, and you are using some innovative uh, techniques to deal with the uh, uh, with the groundwater or with the uh, stormwater and uh, 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 water issues in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, it basically, we're doing our best to make it look as nice as it possibly can, given the situation. And, and I find the argument, uh, the safety argument, uh, compelling. Uh, I would not want to. Uh, uh, create a situation that uh, we, we would potentially regret down the road. And I, I doubt you'll find another property that looks like this in Montpelier. <laughs> okay, the next landscaping issue, Meredith, you wanna give an overview? Yeah, I'll give a quick overview. I mean, I think that, that everything that Brian and Mindy just said applies to okay. the shade trees as well. Um, but for parking landscaping, there is a shade tree requirement. Um, when you're having a major site plan with um, 10 or more parking spaces, which we've triggered here. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the, the details on this, but there's there's a requirement that you have enough shade trees to shade the equivalent of 40% of the proposed parking area. Um, so I, I didn't end up calculating exactly how many shade trees that would require because the applicant here is applying for a variance to say that they, they can't put any shade trees. Um, and just to go go through really quickly, and this is partly for the record, um, you know, there's a the variance standard is in section 4603 that applies to both the street tree and the, the shade requirement here that they're asking for a variance from. And the basic elements are that there are unique physical circumstances or conditions with the subject property um, that they're, they're peculiar to that property and there's unnecessary hardship due to these conditions. Um, and 
it's not some circumstance that's created by the regulations themselves um, or the district. And because of these physical circumstances, there's no possibility that the property can be developed in strict conformance with the requirements, the shade tree or street tree requirements. Um, and so the authorization of a variance is necessary to enable the reasonable use of the property, that that unnecessary hardship has not been created by the appellant. Um, it says appellant, applicant. Um, and that the variance is not going to alter the essential character of the neighborhood or the district in which that property is located, um, substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent property. And here, all adjacent property is pretty much the railroad. Um, will not reduce access to renewable energy resources or be detrimental to the public welfare. Um, and then finally, that the applicant is proposing the least deviation possible from the regulations to afford relief. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about those variant standards. It's all in the um, pages 16 through 17 of the staff reports, but I don't know if there's anything that you feel hasn't been addressed yet. I think we're all, we're, we're pretty good. Any um, other questions for the board on the uh, landscaping variants? Uh, okay, seeing none, uh, I guess maybe we'll turn it over to Brian to tackle the lighting. Yeah, so um, further conversation um, in between the, the previous uh, hearing that was scheduled and this one with Meredith, um, we, we would like to propose some lighting for the site um, just for safety and security purposes at this point. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to um, get anyone who was available to prepare a lighting plan. Um, but I can give you um, a sense of what we would like, and then we would just request, you know, it really just comes down to um, all, <laughs> all designers and uh, contractors who could have prepared a lighting plan are extremely busy, um, and, and we didn't, we just couldn't arrange to get someone to do it. Um, but essentially, you know, we would look to put very similar lighting to what was approved for the, the main distillery. So this is the you can see on the screen here, I'm, this is the uh, pole light uh, that's used at the distillery. Um, it's an LED light. It's um, fully cut off and downcast optics. Um, you can see it's, it's night sky approved. It's DLC approved for efficiency. Um, I don't know if anyone's been by the site at night, um, but I think it actually came out really, really, really great there. It's, it's one of the better examples of site lighting I've seen around. Um, so we would generally propose to, to have one site Pole light, um, likely in about this area, but it would probably depend a bit uh, on what our lighting designer decides. Um, and then to have one light mounted on the building, um, so we at least have some cover for lighting in the parking. Um, lighting would be controlled by photo sensor. Um, and then Minty, I think we were we were going to put them on on motion sensors so they wouldn't be on unless the parking lot is used. Is that am yes. I remembering correctly? Yeah which would address the maybe non-authorized use, <laughs> you know, just to have it unlit most of the time would probably be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the lights would only come on if there was motion detected in the parking lot, someone right. was out there. Um, but then if someone was out there, whether uh, it was a, someone, an employee using the parking lot after dark who needed to, you know, see to put their, right. well, I guess you don't put your key in the door anymore, but, uh, you know, needed to see to access their car safely, um, or if someone who wasn't supposed to be there was there, then the lights would come on and, and, and discourage uh, anyone from, from being in there at night who shouldn't be in there. So um, again, I know we don't, we don't have the lighting plan requirement, but we just request that the board um, would um, allow us to submit the lighting plan um, based on our testimony tonight as a, as a condition of the approval. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's okay by me. Any board members have any issues with that or questions? Uh, Claire has a hand up. Claire. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be an advocate for the um, kind of the, the very um, low key lighting, not on all the time, just to go with the aesthetic and the kind of the low usage. Um, I, I live near here. 
Um, and I guess just the, 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 the point of caution with the motion sensor is there's quite a few deer around. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and, and you probably don't really have any close neighbors. That's maybe not um, a big issue, but yeah, I would be kind of an advocate or, or supporter of um, the, 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 the most minimal amount just to keep in keeping with like the aesthetic of kind of the, the parking area that you're proposing. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, hopefully it wouldn't be terribly noticeable if a deer set it off here. There are some street lights along Berry Street, and then the area behind it, it as Cal and Spirits, is the, on much more regularly than they will be here. So it's sort of in between two areas that are already let um, for, you know, the street all night, and the Caledonia turns off later in the night uh, after folks aren't using the space anymore. Fair enough. Um, Brian, so would you be able to have the lights in the parking lot on a timer? Because that is one of those, there's a, um, I can't remember if it's in the riverfront. Did they put it in here about lighting needing to be shut off? Um, well, I guess that's why we were proposing to use the photo cell. So yeah, it so it's only was, on when there's someone was there. Right, except that there's, right, but that's the, it doesn't deal with the deer issue. So I just didn't know if there was a way to have a timer so that even the well, motion I've never sensor seen wouldn't a deer start there, it. But <laughs> You've never I'm seen sure it. it's infrequent. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bald eagle, maybe. Okay. Um, should we move to any public comments at this point? I believe uh, that uh, we've addressed the major issues here. I have the information I need, I think, to uh, you know make a decision here. Um, yeah, Brian, can you turn off your share screen? Yeah, I'm working on it, Meredith. Somehow I got everybody's pictures on top of my Zoom. <laughs> uh, um, hold on. Go away. I got it. There, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, so I am going to share. Let me make sure I have it open. Hold on one second. Um, I have an email from a citizen, although I didn't get her address. I'll make sure to have that for the record um, later. I've emailed her and requested it. So I'll make sure to put it in the permit file because um, I'll need that. Um, and I'm just gonna summarize these at this point. Um, a lot of these things, questions have already been asked um, by board members. Um, so um, this is from Cassia, Cassia Renzio. Um, and so she has one um, question about um, sort of why the tree warden and the um, city's tree board haven't been consulted um, and whether they should be for all future street tree um, or shade tree issues. Um, just as a side note, that's not something that's in the regulations as a requirement. Um, normally, if it would be if there was actually a proposal for a street tree or a proposal that might affect an existing tree, street tree, yes, I would run it by the tree warden. Um, in, in this case, because it is such a specific um, safety issue and something that really isn't in the tree warden's purview and it's much more in the boards um that's one reason it didn't run by alec if the board felt like i needed to we can i can do that we can continue to hearing again and i can run it by them if the board feels like that's necessary um the other category another category of comments is that um uh ms renzio is asking for at least some trees um and we've We've talked about that, and the, you know, if the board has further questions, they can. Um, um, and then we, there was a question about um, bicycle access and storage, and that the board requiring that. And it sounds, you know, we've already had testimony that the um, Caledonia Spirits does have bicycle access um, and storage. We have bike racks. Yep, they have bike, bike racks. Um, and then I'm going to scroll down. She has a question about river access and making part of the new parcel, 
parking lot available for people to park in. Um, and it sounds like the applicant doesn't have any issues with that at this point, um, that it hasn't been a problem. So they don't see that being a large, large impact. Um, there's comments about the permeable pavers um, and liking that there's permeable, permeable pavers and asking that the board um, ask for an interpretive sign. It's already been discussed this evening. Yeah. Um, and then there's questions um, or comments about having the board request for improved pedestrian access. Um, again, those that we've discussed that. I don't think there's really any new points here. Um, there's a discussion about believing that the Housing Board and Parks Commission um, have had their eyes on adjacent Sabins pasture for future housing and park land. Um, and that there might be you know, increased pedestrian tra traffic. Something for the board to note is that Gin Lane up to, I think it's the second railroad track is actually a city street. Mm -hmm. um, so the second interior railroad crossing, it's after that that it's driveway for Caledonia Spirits. So it really is, you know, if there's, a, if there's enough increased pedestrian traffic, the city, you know, the Department of Public Works would be the one to trigger the needing to get somebody to, to put in more Sidewalk. more sidewalks um and we don't at this point you know the city's got a lot of other projects that right. they're working on and they're looking at, at and, and that person needs to know they were planning to put a sidewalk from the bike path to gin lane um, yep and i think i almost think yeah so there's something comment about um i thought you said something in here about that hold on Yeah, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it just says that there's not currently pedestrian access from the Berry Street bike path back down to Jill right. Lane. And, well, and, and there will and be. Yes, there will, there be. will be. And that's one of the things that um, we got in the comments from Department of Public Works right. is that there will be that pedestrian access linking through. Um, and then finally, the final comment on here, I'm going to scroll down, sorry, um, is that asking that if there is lighting added, that it be turned off after business hours. Um, and that it be kept um, as a low level of light. Mm -hmm. yep. So, which, all right. Any uh, final questions uh, from the board on uh, this application? I would also entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing. And uh, yes, Don. Oh, if you want to comment, you got to go up to this microphone up here. So everybody can hear yeah, you. Sorry, and, Don. And identify yourself. Yeah, and so identify my name is Don yourself. Marsh. I'm a civil engineer. And I applaud the use of the chorus pavement. However, I would suggest when he mentioned the light color that they not use uh, crushed granite because that would give you the light color and that's an obvious product available. But we found that the crushed granite from the quarries up here contains radon. And we've had problems with that on other projects. So I would suggest that we don't want to have radon brought into a place where we're going to have infiltration into the ground. So you can use it. You could use other stone. You could use river stone or whatever. But I'd suggest not uh, not the crushed granite. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Do we have a uh, any, any any motions from the board here? I'll make the motion to uh, uh, close the public hearing on uh, 17 Gin Lane. I'll second that. And, well, and, and, oh. reconvene in uh, executive session. Motion I'll by second. Claire? Yes, yeah, second. Yes, Claire. I'll second that. <laughs> uh, okay, I will uh, call the roll. Um, okay. Can I just have a little discussion? Yeah. Okay. So just a, maybe if somebody can make the friendly amendment um, that will reconvene in deliberative session after the close of the public meeting, because yeah. we're not going into deliberative session right now and, and waiting on the next application. I'll, I'll modify my uh, my motion to include. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. And Claire, you need to uh, agree to that as well. I will. I will second that amendment that was made. Okay, Kevin, how do you vote? Yes. Michael. Michael, do you vote yes? No? We couldn't hear you. Yeah, I vote yes. 
Joe. Yes. Abby. Yes. Catherine. Yes. Claire. Yes. Uh, so that is unanimously approved. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation this evening, and we will discuss this after the meeting tonight. And okay. we should hear soon on a decision. Great. Great. Thank, thank you, you, Brian. Thank you. thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone. All righty. Next on the agenda, we have an application for 186 Murray Road. I'm back as an engineer. All righty. <laughs> Just make sure you speak right into that microphone when you do talk, Don. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, Bob. Could we, have, could we have like a two minute break? Yes, let's take a two minute recess. Okay, thank you. Transition here. Okay, I'm going to call this meeting uh, back to order. Is everybody ready? Yes. Well, right. I, I don't see faces for Abby and Claire. Oh. Ah, okay. There's Claire. And Abby, maybe just give a thumbs up if you're there and ready for us to get moving. I think Abby's not back there. Okay. Don, are you the only one that's going to be speaking on this application? Um, actually, I haven't seen uh, Keith. Keith is Joel, here. is he on Zoom? Yep. So the applicant is on is okay. on Zoom apparently. So there'll be two of us. Yep. So right. Keith's here as well, and this is just sketch plan, so you don't have to swear anybody. Oh, else. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're good. I, I knew where that was going. Uh, and this is sketch plan, so we could. I mean, theoretically, we can get started without Abby. We have a quorum. Okay. And we've got another application after, so. Yep. Well, turn it over to you, Don, I guess, to get started uh, on uh, this sketch plan application. Uh, okay. Also. okay, my name is Don Marsh. I'm with Grenier Engineering. Um, we're working with Keith Doyle on the, the subdivision. And I have to start out with an apology that through the process of uh, with help from Meredith and the assessor's office, it turns out that um, two of these lots, what we were calling lot two and lot four, um, are separate standalone parcels already. Um, so they, they're already subdivided. Uh, we misunderstood that. So the subdivision actually becomes instead of a four lot subdivision, it's a two lot subdivision, which is the uh, former Bill Doyle house and uh, Keith Doyle's house now. And the uh, we'd have just over an acre there and a one acre parcel directly to its south, uh, both on Murray Road. Um, so it, it so unfortunately that We've, we've given you a revised plan that reflects that, but it is different than what we, uh, what we presented. Uh, aside from that, um, we'd expect to extend, uh, Municipal Sewer currently has a six inch line that goes from the uh, Doyle home down to Town Hill Road. That's more than enough for, um, for two additional houses. Uh, it's uh, it's plastic looks like it's in good shape at least what we could see so we had expect to use municipal sewer um similarly the lot on uh um, westwood would connect to municipal sewer in front of the home uh, eventually and uh they would all have uh apparently i was also there there's no municipal water on Westwood. So they had all have individual drilled wells from that point of view. Um, from a traffic point of view, um, even with all, all three lots on Murray Road, you'd expect to have a maximum of, or an estimated 
a number of additional trips of 29 a day. And the most would be four or five during either the AM or peak, M, peak hour, peak PM hour. So that we don't believe is the is a particular issue. Um, and as we've noted in our narrative that the impact on municipal services on essentially one new lot, although you could expect maybe, I, I'll go back also. At the moment, both the two pre-existing lots have uh, deed languages, language that prohibits development of any sort. Um, we're trying to sort that out because both the husband and wife associated with that original deed to the Doyles that contain that uh, uh, restriction have uh, have passed. So we need to pursue that because we, our understanding is other lots in the Westview Meadows area had similar restrictions and they asked and were granted permissions to permission to build. But that's um, at the moment, we'll have to represent that there's no building on either of those two lots. And if that happens, that'll well be subject to a zoning permit later anyway. Um, and that we haven't sorted out how to, how to address that particular <laughs> issue. So essentially at the moment, we're asking for one new lot, which would potentially have a single family dwelling on. In which lot would that be? That would be um, what we're calling lot A2. It's the one directly adjacent to, yes. uh, A2, yep. direct, directly adjacent to Keith Doyle's current house. Right. Okay. So essentially that's the only new, new lot. And there are a number of comments in Meredith's staff report that are valid and we'll have to address in uh, before the preliminary. But that's, that's basically our summary. Claire has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Uh, yeah, um, I guess I was wondering, Meredith, um, thank you for the the staff report on 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 all of these and but specifically on, on this one um looks like a lot of you know work going into kind of evaluating kind of the layout of uh, the, the the four lots i was wondering if maybe you could just help point us towards maybe any of your comments that would apply to this revised um plan yep um so so, um, you know, I think that for the final subdivision, for even just the two lots, um, we would want to see, um, you know, just a preliminary d checking where you'd want to put that driveway on lot A2 and just getting a sense of whether or not it meets the distancing requirements from nearby driveways it's not a make or break for the subdivision, but it's good to have that heads up for future development, whether or not you're gonna need a DRB waiver of those distances or an exception, because even then, sometimes then even just a single dwelling unit is gonna require DRB approval for that, putting in that access. Um, and then um, it probably doesn't hurt to have a little bit better understanding of the source for the um, traffic impact numbers that you have. Um, just because it's, I, I'm sure it's from the ITE, um, the ITE, but just just being able to point to, you know, for single family homes, ITE states so many trips per day and so many, you know, in the peak hours, it just helps the, the board and then that way it's in there in the record where it comes from. Um, they've dealt with the, the, you know, the sewer, especially because there's not going to be a proposal now for, um, houses on that bigger, further lot, further up Murray road on the end. Um, hold on just a quick scan. So you're correct. Oh. In that case, it would be, we would just be connecting 
that lot because the yep, sewer the new, runs right through that yep, lot too. Yep, lot A2. A2 can connect to the sewer, no problem. Um, everything else, you know, we would still need the draft plat for the final subdivision application that actually shows where all the new pins go, all of that data. Um, and we would want that as complete as possible, just needing basically the signatures to finalize it. Um, so that's one thing that's still needed. And uh, sorry, you you pointed out that uh, we need to move the proposed driveway on the the uh, on the existing lot. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, it, that other lot. That's, do that that's just to separate. Clean it up. That's we we would deal with those two that's other only. lots. Okay. The existing lots you and I will talk about and and keep okay. separately. That would be two other different permit applications. Okay. That wouldn't be the subdivision at all. Um, you know, we'd still need to have something in your final narrative about the electric utilities, just because that is a, a, a item that comes up frequently. But you've got the the overhead lines going up the street, so that's not going to be a problem, really. I don't think. And that's it. I mean, when you narrowed it down to just these two parcels, there's not a whole lot more that I think needs to come in. But right. Go ahead, yeah. Kevin. Yeah, and that that's that's what I wanted to to uh, to make sure of. We're just dealing with your current plan is just that one lot, basically, right? One new lot. Yes. One new lot. That's all that needs subdivision that's, approval. That's the only thing that requires subdivision approval. Yep. So, uh, your application, if you're going to go that direction, would look different than what we have right now. Yes, we'll correct right. it to that. It, it, would, it would just need to be updated to reflect that. And and uh, how the covenant on the development rights for that parse for those parcels uh, that, that that's not our purview, obviously. And uh, so all of that would have happen on a on a on another venue, not this one. So Understand? You know, yeah. I haven't figured out that venue yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, right. but you're certainly right. Well, you yeah. know, he's, I, 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 yeah. I think there may be some genealogy required. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there's a number of these issues we can, you know, go into more thorough detail once we have all the information at the final and don't want to <laughs> be redundant here. Um, you've been here before, so you know what you know what to do. <laughs> well, and and we'll need, you know, Keith and you and I can have a a meeting, whether it's in person or Zoom, before the final application. You know, we can talk. I'll I'll get you the meeting minutes. Not that there's going to be much in them about this, yes. um, but I'll get you the meeting minutes, and we'll talk and and go through a little more in detail about the holes I see with moving this to just a two lot subdivision application. Um, and then when before you actually submit that with the fees, we can have a meeting our, our conference um, to go through it and just make sure that there aren't any other holes before it gets submitted. Well, that's good. Before we start doing the survey work to get the plat ready. Yeah, exactly. Before before Keith is paying for a surveyor to, to do the plat, we can all meet up and, and make sure that we're happy with what what's on there and what what doesn't need to show anymore. So fortunately, some of the one of the few places where there are actually pins are actually on the adjoining lot <laughs> to the one that we're we're creating. So we're in pretty good shape there. Good, good. Um, all right, I think I think I'm set here. Thank you, thank you, Don. Yeah. I think I'm all set. All right. I see I see nodding going on. I don't see any hands. So yeah. Well, this is just a just a reminder. It's sketch plan review, and there's no no. Uh, 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 specific action that the board takes for for sketch plan review. It's advisory, and uh, uh, that's what we've done here this evening. Well, we always appreciate the input. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Don. So, okay. The next item on the agenda. I don't have anything anyone here in person, but Tim Heaney, yep. I believe, is on the Zoom. And um, this is an application uh, related to the removal of two chimneys uh, at 79 Main Street. And um, Meredith, do you want to give an overview of the application? Yeah. Um, so as you said, this is um, 
uh, application for demolition of some chimneys on 79 Main Street. This is a structure that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So we're dealing yet again with demolition of a part of a historic structure. Um, now this, this is a little different from some of the other ones the board has dealt with because um, you're dealing with something that's in some ways right now it's it's a decorative aspect because the chimneys are no longer functional um and for the application in addition to them no longer being functional they are um causing structural weaknesses and issues in the remainder of the building right now um now the there is the if you look in the application um, i included the copy of the um, building permit application because on that part um, it clearly says that the plan is to um, save the bricks, um, the ones that can be that are in good condition, right? Save those for potential use in replacement structures, so replacement chimneys. So the applicant is considering replacing the chimneys with something that is going to look like these chimneys, but isn't going to have the um, structural problems that these do because they're they're no longer supported all the way down somewhere along the way and nobody really knows where <laughs> they got cut off and they're now just resting on wood um and we have huh. you know we have letters in here from our building inspector and our fire chief who's also one of the um, health inspectors saying that this just this isn't safe but we don't have the, the one of the big big things that we don't have in this application is something from an engineer um, I think that, that the applicant said that they might be able to have this. So I think it's probably the right time to pass it on to Tim. Okay, Tim, uh, okay. turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, Meredith, thanks for the summary. It, basically, yeah, the old chimneys um, sometime way back were cut off and they now rest on eight by eights on the attic floor. And uh, they're really large. So I, I guess that we have had engineering ventures into look at it. Um, and really more looking at how we can replace or if, if, how is this going to work to put something back that will have the visual uh, impact and um, not have the structural problems with the amount of weight that's up there right now that's just dead weight sitting on the old beams and um, and currently the, the sections above the roof the mortar has just you know eroded and um, those sections are in really rough shape at this point um, the one actually to the right toward the Blanchard block, um, it's it shifted back significantly with just the force of the wind and and nature this last uh, year or two. And uh, so that's our concern. So we really wanna take them down um, and we are evaluating different options for replacement. I got a call from Eric Gilbertson today, um, talking about an inn in Grafton where they dealt with a similar situation and they used uh, uh, some a fiberglass chimney system which i haven't seen yet but we will investigate that um you know our goal is when we replace uh, we, we want it to look good we want it to make sense i mean it, it, at this point it's the safety issue for us that's motivating this request to just demolish and remove them um, until we can have that plan ready to to replace kevin uh, so, Tim, uh, is the current situation? Microphone. I know it's hard because you want to look at him. <laughs> you is can this, look at him here on my, on, on my computer. I'm good, thanks. Okay. Uh, the, cur the current situation, is it uh, actually posing a public uh, safety issue at this point? Yes. No, no question about it. So like, I guess that, that maybe we, you can elaborate on that. It's not an imminent public safety, but a, a budding, you know, public safety that actually needs to be taken. Uh, what, what, where are we at here? <laughs> um, it's well beyond budding. Uh, it's there, the, the pieces above the roof are, they're really dubious. And, um, you, you know, if one of them falls up there in that location, you know, they're going to, they're just going to come raining down on busy sidewalks on Main State Street. Um, you know, on, on the Blanchard block side, which is the one that looks the most dubious to me, you know, that's the alleyway where people pass through all the time. Um, I, I really 
so they need to come down um, to, to mitigate that. And then, you know, certainly uh, even to replace, they're going to have to come down um, and then rebuild. So it's, 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 there's no benefit to leaving them. You're not going to save what's there. Um, it, Kevin, yes. Do you have a time frame as to when the uh, replacement would be um, installed or, or plans that you would have to have a schedule for that? I really don't. Um, it's something you know we'd like to just deal with it and deal with it reasonably quickly. But you know, to say within a year might be more uh, be possible. It's just a matter of coming up with the right solution and then coming back, permitting it, um, whatever needs to be fabricated. Certainly, I think in most of the options we've looked at for for a potential replacement, there's been different types of interior structures that would need to be fabricated. Uh, several of them had steel. Um, the, the chimneys that are there now are actually, if you're looking at the photos, they're, they're really much bigger than you might guess from these pictures or from the street. When you get, it's like, you know, you go four stories up and, um, and uh, they, they really are big. Yeah, they're substantial. There's no question about that. And they're multiple courses of brick thick. Um, and so just. What did the, uh, uh, can you summarize for us the design? Uh, oh. review yeah um tim do you have a piece of paper over your microphone do you um i don't do i now no okay nope i just I, somebody's somebody's microphone keeps moving i don't know hmm. um okay so hold on one second let me get to my design review um so design review the design review committee um which uh intending at at the design review for that meeting were two of our the city's historic preservation specialists. Um, they, they really, they approved it under all the applicable criteria um, with notes about that the demolition is required due to safety issues. Um, and, you know, that they really want um, bricks, you know, especially the good bricks that are still good and would be good examples um, that are removed during the demolition um, to be saved for replication um, during the replacement phase. You know, I think, I think if this had been a plan for demolition without replacement, they would have had a lot more questions and yeah. and conditions. Um, you know, they they did have a comment about wanting to make sure that when they were replaced, they looked very similar and had the S and the same type of of bonded brick, um, but or at least something that looked like the bonded brick. <laughs> um, but they, I mean, they seem to feel that demolition in this instance made sense, that it was a safety issue. And I'm inclined to agree with that report. I mean, uh, public safety should always be our first concern. Um, I, um, I mean, I, I might suggest that we, that we put some kind of time frame around what the replacement, when that would be, you know, ready for installation or, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I'm throwing it out there for discussion. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the, you know, a typical zoning permit would have a two year window um, with an option for a third year if it's requested before the end of the permit. Now this is a little different because the job, the demolition will be done once the chimneys are taken down and stuff is this, this the roof is capped, right? This is an application just for the demolition. Yes. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's beyond. I, I think it would be reasonable to ask for an application as long as Tim is okay with that. And, you know, an application for replacement. But we also don't know, you know, we don't know what the, what the economy holds and everything else. So it's going to be kind of up to the board what they think is reasonable for how long, if it would be like two years, we have to see an application or, you know, two years with the option for the applicant to request a third. I, I don't know. Um, I know Claire has a question in there. Claire, um, go ahead. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm kind of like a little bit struggling with kind of our, um, our kind of a, approval of, of options. I mean, I guess I, I'm looking at this in, in the absence of having the reconstruction plan 
I'm, I'm hesitant to kind of condition an approval on a reconstruction. And I'm just wondering if like the cleanest way is just to look at this as demolition. And when reconstruction happens, that's another component. I would just, I just, I just don't want to be in a position where we're, we're potentially looking at, um, you know, a condition in which says you must reuse those bricks in the reconstruction <laughs> where we don't, we don't know the, you know, that, that could be completely unfeasible. And I, and I wouldn't want to yep. kind of tie our hands with something like that. So I guess I'm kind of throwing it out there of um, if, if we're looking at kind of maybe just looking at this as just a, just demolition and removing the reconstruction kind of off, off the table for the purposes mm -hmm. of the approval that we're looking at tonight. So that would be a cleaner way to do it. Here, here's, here's my concern. Um, it would be, be, be fine to, to uh, permit the, uh, the demolition this evening. Uh, I'm, and I'd want to do that in an expeditious way so that it can be, so it can be taken care of. Uh, uh, sooner rather than later, uh, but at the same time, I'm just I'm, I'm very uh, aware of the uh, visual impact that that building has with its two chimneys uh, from um, from State Street uh, in particular. And uh, so, my thinking is is that if we put a um, a condition, and we can word the condition. In a in a benign way, I suppose, uh, to to address the uh, visual reconstruction. And I use that word intentionally because I don't think that I would mandate that they use the old materials. They might come up with a a facsimile which which works just fine and is much kinder to the uh, old the old bones of the building. Um, so that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going with this. Is that let's get this, let's get the demolition okay, keep the keep the sidewalk safe, but let's put a kicker in there so that uh, we don't uh, find ourselves, you know, in uh, 2025 going like, huh, I wonder whatever happened to those chimneys. So that's my thinking. Lost the screen here. Yeah. Lost the screen. Uh, it it'll it's been on so long it probably got warm and rebooted. There okay. we go. Yep. Um, it's old. I tend to agree with what Kevin just said. Uh, any other thoughts from the board? I would ask Tim what he thinks as well. Yeah. Um, Tim, uh, what's what are your thoughts on uh, board comments so far? Uh, I haven't heard anything I disagree with. It seems reasonable. Um, <laughs> You know, the, two, the, three, the two year window with, a, with an option for a third certainly is in line with what I'm thinking. So I'd love to do it sooner. It's, uh, it's nothing that will pay to have it drag out for us. We'd rather just do it. Yeah. Um, one question, do you have any uh, sort of additional information as far as where you're at with, you know, the engineer you've worked with or whatnot? Uh, you know, uh, I know that you've probably got some dr draft plans of what reconstruction might look like and but Do you have anything to share at this point? No, I mean, I've talked to the, the engineers about, you know, what's there and, and about how to redo it. They, they initially talked about, was there a way to stabilize it and save those? Um, and it just really wasn't a satisfactory option. So, you know, and it's like everybody I talked to seems to have a different version of what they suggest <laughs> for how to do it. Like at the last hearing, somebody said, oh, at least nobody's talking about Z-Brick. And I said, you know, somebody actually suggested that. <laughs> okay. um, and it's not something we want to do. Although the concept, I mean, if you look at options we're thinking about, I know like on the new transit center building that has a brick facade on it. Um, but I believe those bricks are a thinner, like a three quarter inch, um, brick and so they're real brick but yet there's a lot less weight um so, so possibly a system that could be constructed that would stay up there um stand up to the winds that barrel down state street and uh and still have that historic element uh, it is an option we're, we're talking about but i don't have a picture of it for you yet yeah 
Yeah, I think Tim, part of the part of the issues is that for the demolition of even part of a historic structure, mm -hmm. um, you know, the burdens on the applicant to provide enough documentation um, okay. to to let the board, you know, approve it. Yeah. Um, and so that's like if you had even you know anything in writing from your engineers that you've worked with, even if it's just an email, mm -hmm. you, know, you could you could even forward it to me, and I could then send it out to all the DRB members while we're here. Um, anything like that, talking about how it's not really feasible to repair what's there. Okay. I don't know if you have anything like that. Um, that the repair isn't feasible, that you really need to tear it down and build something different mm -hmm. that looks the same. I don't know if you have anything in writing like that. I don't. We really jumped right. Meredith and Rob, this is Michael. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, why can't we just pin the design review board finding to this showing of need from the applicant and then move forward with this two to three year time frame. I feel if the historic preservation experts are good with it, it I'm just sensing the uh, internet room here, but it feels like we're good with it. And I feel like the workaround is this two to three year window and we just pin this proof of evidence to the design review board. The, yeah. the board has the option to do that. I was just digging to make sure that Tim yeah. didn't have something else to add to the record. <laughs> yeah, we jumped right to solutions and I didn't <laughs> put that in writing, so I'm sorry. But I mean, I, 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 think can, that, I can get it for you, but I can't send it tonight. So. From, from what I'm gathering from, you know, what information in the record and whatnot, I, I think there is a public safety issue here and that's first and foremost. And um, I think that the board can deliberate on the exact path forward um, but we've got the information we need to, to come up with that path sort of in line with what we discussed here. So if, unless anyone has anything to add, I'm, we'll entertain a motion. Oh, hold on. Let me just double check that there's not something else you need to discuss. <laughs> well, we can make the motion and then open it yeah. for discussion. Yeah. So, so I'll make that motion to, uh, uh, to close the public hearing and, uh, uh take this up. Uh, later this evening in deliberative session. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second from Joe. Uh, is there any discussion? No, no, no. It's, I, I went through the staff report. We're good. Okay. Uh, so I will call the roll on um, whether to close the public hearing and take this up in deliberative session at the end of the tonight's public meeting. Uh, Kevin, how do you vote? Yes. Michael? Yes. Yes. Joe? Yes. Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Claire? Yes. <clears throat> The motion, oh, and I, Rob votes yes. Uh, the motion is approved and um, we will take this matter up uh, in the deliberative session at the close of this public meeting. Um, um, oh, what oh. happened to the meeting? Oh, we already did that. Um, did yeah, you can't close the public meeting till I send out the actual invite, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our next meeting will be on uh, November 15th. Yep, and we do have an application, so we will be meeting. Uh, you can, as long as everybody knows that they're going to get an email with me from me with the link, I'll, uh, well, we can do that in a few minutes. Well, thank you, you Tim. Best of luck with the rest of the, uh, the project, and I think that, uh, I will entertain a motion to, uh, close this public meeting and uh, enter into a deliberative session. So moved. We just have other business. I don't know. Is there any? No, we, no. we don't. Other meeting, okay. November 15th, adjournment. We're good. Okay, we're good. I'll second that. Okay, we guess we have to vote on this. Uh, Kevin, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Michael, how do you vote? Yes. Joe? Yes. 
Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Claire? Yes. Thank you.